we will let the people drift in. Drift in like they, they don't use to. We're pretty much all the time, but I guess the weather's been, been a tough winter for a lot of these travelers here. But all this is going to be recorded. It's all broadcasted live, and as a lot of you know here, I mean, hi, Kath, how you doing? Hi, good. Uh, so, oh, we're just maybe waiting for a few people. Let's go around the room and tell our guests who we are, what are we doing, and tell them not to go to your house to do an inspection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, not, he's not with the government, though, so he might want to go there and help me out. <laughs> Go ahead, start us off. I'm Jeff Travis. Uh, this is my wife, Crystal. Uh, we're from Colorado. We moved here about a year and a half ago. We've done uh, fix and flips, have some rentals. Um, we're here enjoying the, the trees, the water, the people, um, and just getting back into some real estate. We bought a couple pieces of property while we've been here and remodeling it and uh, just pushing forward. Um, so you have the, uh, how many acres you have on that? 47. 47 out here in Hill Lake. Correct. Yeah. There. And all the property you have out there, or you have more properties? There's two, there's two properties connected. Oh, good. All right. Uh, Irina, with your fur coat. My name is Irina Dubinska, and I had a few deals done. Yeah, yeah. And we bought so you have some property in Florida, two or three properties in Florida, and you have a couple properties here and you flipped a few. Yeah. You did very, very well. Yeah. And you're enjoying the looking looking forward to do some more deals. Do more deals. We love doing more deals. Mm -hmm. Kathy, she's looking to punch her first deal out shortly. I am. Kathy Groda, I'm a retired CPA who by day does mortgages, so if you know anybody or you sell a house to somebody and they need a loan, I can help them. Uh, I also specialize in the senior loan, which I call a great one, everybody calls it a great one. But I've been bird dogging, I've been going uh, to the houses and looking at who uh, has a day already to be foreclosed and haven't, haven't hit one yet, but you know, have been talking to people. And have a way of figuring that out. Uh, bird dogging is uh, pass a deal on to somebody. Yeah. Uh, it just it it takes a while, but then you hit fast. Uh, as Anthony here, he I guess you guys just did another deal uh, a couple days ago or last That's week. I was gone. Yeah. Tell me about that deal. Where'd you find, how, how did, for Kathy's sake and all of us, how did you knock on a door? Or how did you find it? This one was uh, through a teammate of mine. Um, they found him um, through some social media out there. And they created a relationship and then dug deeper after they conversed with something. She found out that he needed to sell a house. And that's what happened. Right. Yeah, so we're not to visit the home. Uh, he was asking more for the, but the property was worth needing to be fixed up. So we negotiated and came to it with an agreement and had it sold. Yeah. And, and all that took how long? It probably took a <laughs> week. I don't want to ask you what happens to me, but you, you partnered in with people here, right, in the office. That's what we do. What's up, guys? I'm Go ahead. You're up. Jeff Kendig. I uh, have some rentals, and I do some reasonably on land, and used to do some flips. Haven't done one in a while, so I'm uh, always a pretty good deal. Jeff's been dragging his feet here. We're going to get him moving a little bit faster. Uh, Transitioning out of corporate America, to be honest. Uh, this spring is going to be Jeff's year. We're going to get you out of your your comfort zone and get you pushing forward because the guy's a machine. And uh, as a matter of fact, he had a nine hundred thousand dollar ten thirty one exchange that he was working on. So he's a, he's a he's a big deal. 
it was John. Tell us about you, John. I do real estate have been for about 35 or so years, so all phases of it. Not much of right now I've got some energy efficient ones. We're going to get all of them up. So we're still out there. 70% less uh, energy cost. 50% less maintenance. Uh, we're highly far retarded. California that I'm a guy got sick I couldn't go yet to go out there in Sonoma where 5,500 houses burn and they're anxious to find out about this not burning it. There's a video where I was that that shows it don't burn. That, uh, that's a good idea. Now Florida has the same problem uh, with big forest fires you know they're brush fires but uh, burns half of the Everglades. Right? I'm 30 years in Fort uh, for Myers, and of course that's a that's an idea. I get to that. It gets to the houses, and like yeah. I said, that not only that, two hotels burnt, and several restaurants, and some office buildings, and all kinds of stuff burnt. And you can build and build all of those. You can build strip centers in no time with these panels. Right. These are panelized. <laughs> uh, Forty foot long, can... eight, ten, twelve feet wide. As wide as you can get them on a flatbed truck, I guess. Yeah. And then, I, I mean, of course, they, they build skyscrapers with them so they can stack them. One of the videos shows a blowtorch blowing on the side of it and it didn't even scorch it. Mm -hmm. And you can get them in brick, any color you want. Yeah, you want it to stone, look like they take the panels, and it's a CAD like thing where it goes through there and cuts and makes it look like brick. You can color each individual one. And I don't know if anybody's been in, in uh, Polly's office, but in there, you got some stone in there. They're light beige, dark beige, real light, you know, all kind of different colors. You can do exactly that. And on the website, they've got one showing that restaurant with all kind of different colors and all kind of different. Colors. They have channels already cut in there for the electric going through, probably the right. plumbing too. If you get the engineer to just all they got to do is core out the uh, <coughs> styrofoam, run the channels through. So you uh, give them the blueprint and they'll create it. Interior walls, exterior walls, never have to paint. Uh, also, the foundation, of course, the roof. And it's, oh, by the way, it's it's metal framing too. Uh, everything is energy efficient. It's recycled that they're using. So, if you buy that house, Uncle Sam will send you a check. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, who are you? Oh, hello. Okay, my name is Reggie. Uh, a buddy of ours told us about this meeting that you guys uh, talk about real estate. And I'm just hoping to uh, come check it out. Um, I was a, uh, I just graduated from MTSU a year ago. Um, I have no experience in real estate at all, so I'm just hoping to learn some. Well, you hit the right place sure. because we, uh, uh, you can get a lot of information out of this place over awesome. here. It's, it's terrific for new people and it's terrific for experienced people who can get to that next level, and that's what you want. Awesome. Thank you. What, what's your friend's name? Who? who? Zach. Zach. You know Zach? Oh, yeah, we got a Zach. Too. Yeah, Zach and Jared. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they, they just joined a couple weeks ago. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. My name's Kazadi Kazadi. Um, I'm pretty new to this as well. Um, maybe been listening to some podcasts over the past couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, our friend Zach uh, told me about it. So I thought I'd come out. Zach coming out today or? Not today. He, he said he wasn't feeling well. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> I had that about six times today. Actually, less than his wife were here just a few minutes ago and, and we went home. Uh, Steve, you want to say hi? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, now I hear you. All right. Hey, guys. Uh, so uh, I'm Steve Chasen, uh, co-founder of this deal with Mark. And uh, uh, I actually am just returning from an auction. We've uh, we purchased three properties this week at auctions, a couple of them with uh, partners of ours in green. And um, so uh, I'm out in the field quite a bit and uh, running a little late to our meeting. I'm going to be in, in in shortly, but uh, uh, pretty decent deal today. Um, not not the the greatest deal in the world, but this is what we do. Um, we bought a uh, bought a double wide for forty thousand dollars, but it's within half an hour of Nashville, and uh, uh, should be a pretty easy flip. Uh, yesterday we bought a. Two 2,000 square foot house brick 
with the metal roof on 30 acres, 96,000. And then we bought a nice house in Mount Juliet. Yes, well, I say nice, rehab house for 125,000 in Mount Juliet yesterday. So uh, I'm pretty active in the game and uh, it, it uh, causes me to be late to our meetings from time to time, but uh, still want to meet everybody, hear the stories and try to, uh, uh, try to create that activity point where uh, where the money actually meets the the deal and, and people that are, are interested in, in getting going can actually make a deal happen. Um, that's what we're most interested in creating is, is uh, uh, people actually getting together and making the deal happen. So um, um, I I'll be in in about 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm gonna go put my suit on and uh, change. Um, and and uh, so, but I, I wanted to turn tune into the uh, intro to the meeting and say hi to everybody. Still driving, like it looks like you are. You're not around here, so there's too much traffic. You make it 15 minutes, but do the best. I, I'll be I'll be there in about 15. All right, good deal. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Three deals this week. You, when I say you hit the right place, go to any other meeting anywhere. Same thing got three deals in the whole group. We got three deals this week. We got about, Steve got like 20 of them sitting out there that we just bought. Because we work as a team here. We don't just say, hey, I got a deal for you, and everybody fights to get the deal, and what's that to us is just drive the price up. Now, we don't do that here. We say, hey, you want to go on a deal? Hey, it's your first deal. If your first deal, here's a little $40,000 deal for you. We try to find deals for you new investors or any investors to say, you know, you know I, I'm knocking on doors. I can't find any deals. Well, we try to help you out since we're experienced at it. We have people to do it. We actually teach people to knock on doors. Well, we're doing it for you. Uh, I have deals in Florida that you can get into, uh, even cheaper, you know, $15,000. We're doing tiny houses and stuff. I am constantly, and Steve is, is doing it in, 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 up here in Nashville, but I'm going around the country trying to find investment-grade stuff for all of our guys to say, hey, I need some passive, but I don't want to do houses. I, I don't fix. Uh, it's too scary for me. Uh, because it is, it, it's, it's, you don't know what's behind the wall when you rip it down. And that's gets scary for people who are new. I mean, you only have so much money to play with. And if you're playing on a limited budget and all of a sudden you knock a wall down, and there's a million termites are flying around, you know, the rest of the house is bad too. So I try to find other investments, notes to buy. You, know, you can buy for two thousand bucks, make you know sixteen, eighteen, twelve, ten percent. Uh, so I have note teachers come in here and teach you about how to buy notes, how to buy tax deed sales, and I do a lot of that in Florida myself. Uh, I just was with, uh, talking to a group out of Chicago. You know, they're a little higher; they're at fifty thousand dollars for our better players. They buy. Apartment complexes. You, you buy in for fifty thousand or more. You got to be certified, and uh, they give you a seventeen percent return, interest only for twenty four months, and then they you know, then they 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 buy it. You, they buy you all out, and you, and you can put in for the next deal, or and they have like deals coming every six weeks. So I am constantly, you know, uh, that's what we do is we try to find, and, and everybody in here is bringing deals inside here, so you guys have some stuff to play with. And we don't, you know, going to a place and trying to learn from scratch is, is great. But boy, getting a little helping hand or a little boost, here you go. And you get, you, and if you get in trouble, like, hey, I want to fix this. This is use this motor home, mobile home thing. You start fixing it, you run into problems, and so you say, you know, I'm stuck. I'm going to lose my shirt. Kathy knows she was here one day, had a problem with uh, she was closing a deal. She's a mortgage person, closing a deal. 
this that the seller was going to back out because uh, they wanted those. They, I mean, the buyer was going to back out because they wanted the seller to do something. She called another guy in this group. Seven o'clock the next morning, he had his roofing guy or an air conditioning guy. I think one of each at two different occasions. Just yeah, no problem. You're in our group. We'll help you out. I mean, this this guy will probably help you out regardless of where you are. But that's just the kind of people we we draw around here. <laughs> There he is. So no, we're doing a little introductions real quick. So well, I'm just sort of killing some time so uh, people start coming in. Go <laughs> ahead, <laughs> you're on the spot. My name is Jamie Parker. I'm on the vessel here in Nashville. been here about three years. I just connect, I guess. Sorry, I got shot up. What's your, uh, <laughs> what? Uh, what's your recent, last recent property you've been buying? Oh, the last, last, uh, the wholesale deal, I, the wholesale deal I did was what? October? Close in October. It was uh, three single families on a five acre track of land. It's pretty, pretty legit. Um, yeah, it just had a, had a buyer came in and picked it up. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so we teach you how to do that kind of stuff. Uh, Irene and I were just down, I got a call the other day. <clears throat> That from a, from a guy in Florida, he said, "Oh, I heard you're you always looking for a land in Fort Myers for your sailboats." Well, because once you get known that you're a buyer, people start coming to you. That's why you got to join a group, get the word out, get the word in. Hey, I'm new. You know what? These guys will start passing your deals. So we down and look at it, and it was an unbuildable lot, $15,000, but it had an 80-foot seawall. And I said, well, can you put electric on it? And he said, yeah, for, you can, he went to the county and asked, and they said, uh, for rodent control, for rat, rats. And this is called thinking outside the box. So I went down there, we went to the county, and I asked, they said no, and of course you never believe the county right off the bat, you gotta be the right person, but I said, well, can I put a fence on? And they said, well, no, because you don't, it's not a buildable lot. Uh, I'm gonna check all these things out. I said, well, can I put a dock on the seawall? No, because it's not a buildable lot, so you don't, you can't do anything with the lot. So we were basically gonna back out of it. So I was thinking, I said, well, let me go to the guy next door, and his house was the whole end of this little island. Or, you know, it was a little peninsula. And this little piece was just and touching, actually, it was cut through his, his gate of his driveway. So I said, well, geez, let me go talk to that guy. I'll buy the lot, and I'll give it to that guy, and he'll lease it back to me for 50 years. Now he owns the lot, so if he pulls the permit for me for the fence and the electric and the dock, it's better for him because now he owns a bigger dock because he has a big boat next to that. He owns a bigger dock, and he owns a fence lease on one side, and, it, it, and, with, uh, and he has the two fences, so he can actually use that as a little storage yard at the end of his sort of outside his even property. And then I get to think for 50 years. What do I care about my kids? As long as I can use it for 50 years, I'm happy. <laughs> so 50 years, he got, and now, of course, he gets more of a property, which has more property tax to pay. But hey, you know, there's a little, there's a little So we try to teach you how to think outside the box in here. So we can give you all kinds of crazy tips. Well, that's what you give me. I get the 50 shades of real estate. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> to really tell you a lot about what this building is made of and how, you know, the, the x-ray of this building will tell you how to fix the house. If you can see inside of a person, you can see how to fix a broken bone and stuff like that. We brought a man in here, we'll show you what an x-ray of a house looks like. He's a home inspector. Now, we don't ask you to not get a home inspector. As a matter of fact, we recommend you get a home inspector. But when you're fixing a house and you 
you're working on the house, you say, well, gee, that plug doesn't work. But the, the bottom plug works, but the top one doesn't. That's good enough for me. Or it's even upside down. I mean, you can put that thing in upside down or backside up. They have, they have a meaning, but you don't care as long as the darn thing works. Yeah. I mean, there's a middle, a lot of, middle, you, there might be a deck on the outside. There, there's probably a million things in there that a home inspector is, is going to pick up when you're trying to sell. When you're buying it, it's your money. You don't care. Oh, I'm going to fix that anyway. Don't worry about that. I'm going to rip it out. So you don't even just have to. Time you don't even care if a home inspector comes out because you're planning on ripping all this stuff out anyway and putting it all back. But you go put back that railing on that outside deck of yours and you go to Home Depot and buy their railings that are supposed to be code and they're not code and you put the whole thing up, you finish. That's a waste of money. That guy's going to come over to your house because he's getting paid from the other side. To chop your house apart, no offense, doesn't nobody really likes you guys. Uh, because yeah, and and you're going to you know stuff you can fix easy. Well, you can fix easy. But if he finds electric or plumbing problems or air conditioning problems, you're going to have to get somebody certified in there. You know, which is going to cost me money. So if you know what he looks for. Well then, you know, you'll be you'll be that old. Gee, I better fix that before the home inspector catches. You know, you don't have to worry about the guy, but you want to worry about how much is it going to cost you after. Or you might lose the deal. They might say, "Oh, there's too many things wrong with this house," because he's going to give a, a detailed list of every room and every plug and every uh, sink. Okay. And if that list looks too big, these ladies are going to get scared and they're not going to buy the house. Well, you just had that thing off the market for two months. They're ready to close, and that's when this guy comes in. You know, that's when they get a call for that final inspection. And if they bail on that, you, now you're holding that property for another two months. And in our business here, you guys know time is money. You're paying for the money that you're using to buy the house. We bought three properties today. We'd like to sell them tomorrow. Right. And we do sell them in a day. Because we borrow, you know, up to 15%. That's a big chunk of change. But when you do it quick enough, if you if you know what you're doing, you do it fast enough, and you know what your profit is going to be, you don't mind paying a lot of money. So I'm going to bring Mike up right now, and he's going to scare the heck out. I mean, he's going to show you the ins and outs of home inspection. <laughs> okay, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have spoke to realtors before. One of the ladies said, I I hate home inspection. Well, we didn't have the right one, maybe. That's, I, I try not to make people mad. I'm going to give you a little bit of history about myself, where I come from. I'm, I grew up in East Tennessee uh, in the mountains, right in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains up there. Went to college for a little while uh, at East Tennessee State, and, and uh, I'm, I, I'm uh, dating my, myself here, but. Uh, there's a war going on in Vietnam. They said, you know, you're probably better suited for the military than you are college. So, so I took their advice and joined the Air Force. Four years in the Air Force, my uncle calls me. He says, uh, have you ever run a backhoe? I said, no. He said, would you like to learn? I said, yeah. That was my first uh, introduction to, to uh, construction. He put me on a backhoe. I started putting in septic systems. I started digging footings for uh, houses. He was a general contractor, by the way. <clears throat> then uh, I learned from the ground up. I told you, they called me a toter. I told you the lumber for the carpenters. Then I learned, then they let me buy a hammer. And uh, I was really something. Then I bought a saw, you know, so I built my toolbox up. So I learned how to build houses from the ground up, you might say. We shot the grades, cleared the land, dug the footings, laid the block, framed, Put the roofs on and everything. He did everything most of it. So I, I learned a little bit of everything there. So uh, fast forward, moved down to Middle Tennessee, moved in the Franklin area, built my first house by myself. And when I say, well, I had a father-in-law that helped me. 
and I and uh, this house it was uh, 2,300 square feet. Most of it was built at night. I worked building houses during the day. Went and built my house at night all day Saturday and Sunday. So in eight months it was almost livable. And we were talking about codes a while ago. Wasn't many codes then. We didn't have a code inspector. I had it. I actually had it in the drive before I went and got a uh, permit to build the house. <laughs> He said, you got to have this, I'll have that. I said, got that, got that, got that. And I was ready to go. So in the meantime, I'm building up, uh, went to work uh, for the Franklin Fire Department. I was a firefighter, EMT, uh, engineer on a 102-foot ladder truck. At the same time, I became a general contractor myself. I uh, was also a realtor. Started out with Century 21. So that introduced me to a whole new thing. Uh, in the building side, you know, uh, I learned how to uh, see little problems with houses, what people wanted, and I worked in real estate for 10, 15 years, like 15 years, I guess, and I also had my fire department job. Seven days a week, something had to go. I gave up my fire department job. Then uh, 2009 and 10 hit, and I said, oh, I made a bad choice here. <laughs> did anybody lose any money during that time? Did anybody? <laughs> but, but we did. I mean, it was like starting over again. So fast forward, uh, uh, worked as a project manager for a few companies. I have um, good friends, a general contractor. So he and I formed this company four years ago called Tennessee Property Inspections. He's still a general contractor. I let my license go. But we're still building. We've got uh, 26 acres in Galton that we put on the market today. They just got listed today. And uh, we're building uh, five houses, maybe six, on 26 acres. So it's looking uh, looking promising for us again. So Now, uh, when people say, I hate home inspectors, I've seen some that I probably hate too because I've read reports where there's a chip in the paint on that door face. Uh, there's a dent in the drywall. Uh, the There's a rattle in the carpet. I, I, I do not write anything up like that. I'm, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in the aesthetics. I'm interested in the functionality of a home, the structural, the mechanical part, the electric part, the plumbing part. That's what I'm interested in. And I may not like the way it looks, uh, the colors, you know, uh, some homeowners, uh, they they watch one of the uh, home improvement shows and all of a sudden they're painters and, and remodelers, you know, and, and I, can, I can usually walk in the house and, and uh, tell if it was professionally done, if it was being flipped and the flippers did it and they didn't know much about it or if a professional did it. So I take all that into consideration. Take age of the house into consideration also. I mean, after 40 years, you know, things begin, begin to sag and drop. I'm um, beginning to sag and drop here. So. <laughs> so after time, you know, little things uh, begin to sag and, and doors stick and things like that. And I, I will make notes of it. That doesn't mean the house is falling down. That doesn't mean that it's not a good house. It, it's it's going to happen to the best of them. Some of the um, most common things that I find in a house, I've got a few notes here, and I keep most of my notes in my head, but when I'm driving up to a house, I, I start my inspection right then. I, I look at the lay of the land. The lay of the land is very important. When you're when you're going up, you can do the same thing. You look look what lay of the land. See see if you've got water coming towards that house. See if the house behind it, if their overflows are coming down, if their wastewater or not wastewater, but the the surface water is coming down towards the property you're looking at. That's very important. One one thing I always say is water is the enemy of a house. I don't know of anything that's any worse than water. It can do more damage. And uh, people usually don't come home and every couple of weeks crawl under their house, you know, check it out. And maybe they don't even go around back to the backyard. Uh, but it is so important to keep that water diverted from your house. It can, it can ruin your foundation. It can uh, moisture in your crawl space. It's very bad, of course. You're going to 
you're going to attract these little white bugs, termites, and you're going to, if you don't have mold forming, I don't call it mold, I'm not qualified to call mold mold, I have to call it microbial growth. But, you know, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's probably going to be a duck, but I call it microbial growth, and I doubt if there's ever been a house that I haven't found some. Some of it is a little bit dusty, some of it looks like uh, big wads of cheese on it on the floor joist. Now that needs attention when it gets that bad. <laughs> Did one house, it was uh, out near, uh, it was right down the street from Belmont, and uh, the lady bought it for her daughters. They were going to school there, and she wanted to have this house. Uh, little one to see if it was worth the money for them to live in. So I went in, you know, it's an older house, been rewired seven or eight times. In a good community, though, you know, and uh, it, it needs work. And I uh, uh, went into the laundry room, I closed the door, and I looked down, and there's mushrooms growing up through the floor behind the door. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, uh, I took a picture of that and showed everybody, you know, throwing their own mushrooms in there. It, it definitely had a moisture problem and fungus problem, mold problem in that crawl space. So moisture, you want to keep away from that house. The ways to do it is backfill. It's an easy fix. Takes a little bit of elbow grease. You put backfill to get your foundation. Come up as high as it takes. You're going to have to visualize this. You've got a hill coming down, and you want to build a little swale. It's called a swale that turn, turns that water away from your house, where it's not just flowing and flowing and flowing against your foundation. Sooner or later, it's going to find its way into that crawl space. It's going to pond there. It's going to seep in. And a lot of basements, they'll put, they'll put block seal on, on the basement walls, on the concrete block. Now, that, that's going to keep that water from getting into the basement. But what it is, that block is filled up with water, too. It's best to stop it on the outside before it gets to the inside. That's a whole, you know, if it's feasible. You want to keep that water on the outside. Nothing good ever comes from water coming into your house. So I'm walking around the house, and, and I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the lady of it and, and what it takes. And I'll advise the people. If they ask, I'll advise them what it would take to turn it in. And a lot of people think that um, when I write something up, you're talking about that list, Mark. You know, sometimes i got a pretty good list. But in my first statement on my reports, 99% of the time I put on there that there was no major structural damage. It may be a list, but it's small things. And I try to explain that to people. I don't want to scare them. I want the deals to work for the people, for the buyer and the seller. Very seldom do I, and I wouldn't advise anybody unless they ask my opinion if they should buy the house or not. Very, very seldom if I told them no. I, you know, it's, it's going to cost you more money to fix it up than it is. Uh, than what you, your budget allows. So I say, you know, you know, growing up, but most of the time, it's just very minor things. So I fix, all it takes is a little bit of um, elbow grease to fix the, put, uh, divert that water away from the house. Make sure your downspouts, make sure they have drains going away from, you know, those corrugated drown, uh, black extension that go on there, corrugated pipe, you can bury them. Get them out of sight. Keep it just any, any way you can get divert that water away from the house. And uh, that solves a whole lot of problems. In the crawl space, uh, you want vapor barrier under there. Check that vapor, vapor barrier. That keeps, you're going to have moisture in the ground anyway. You put vapor barrier, six mil poly is normally what is used. You put vapor barrier on there to keep that from getting up into your. Um, crawl space, or excuse me, your living space, and all of it goes back to the water, keeping that water out. I'm walking around, I see siding, I look at the siding, I, I look for uh, uh, cracks and brick, and this is, this is one thing I hear, this this gets me, somebody will say a step crack in the corner, all of the house, it's terrible, it's all of it. It's got to look at the brick, it's cracked, no, it doesn't mean the house is falling. It means that there's a crack in the brick. The brick's not structural. The brick is holding brick. It's not holding anything up. Your, your foundation, your block, and your uh, studs are holding the house. That brick is the facade. So it's not structural. Don't let that scare you when you're when you're looking at it. Now, if there's cracks three quarter of an inch, 
and it's uh, you can stick your hand in there, there may be a problem there, foundation problem. So what I check that out. If I see a substantial crack in the brick in the siding, inside, when I'm under the house, I look that see if I see a foundation problem. More times than not, I see nothing with the with the block uh, and the foundation itself. It, it's very popular now. I know you've uh, seen uh, a lot of advertisements for these foundation companies that go in and, and they, they jack it up. You have if you see cracks in your brick, you've got a foundation problem. Well, not necessarily. Um, they they do good work. I'm not I'm not saying they don't do good work, but uh, Keep in mind, if, if you have somebody out there giving you a price on that, the, uh, all these uh, advertisers you see on TV, they're, they are they call them project managers, I call them salesmen. They, they're working on 100% commission. So the more they sell, the more money they're going to make. They don't sell anything, they've wasted their time there. So they're going to try things and, and really intimidate the people. If you don't have the knowledge, if you don't get a second opinion, get a second opinion, get a general contractor. It's not necessarily somebody that works foundation, but somebody that knows something about houses. Get a second opinion if there are, uh, if you suspect there are foundation problems. Uh, and that, that surprised me. I knew they, they were on the commission, but I didn't know it was 100%. So just beware, a lot that do good work. I don't know if I'm going to do good work, but just keep that in mind. Uh, inside of the house, and these are these are things I commonly find. Uh, the the negative grade, which is the water coming towards your house, that's I'd say seventy five percent of the houses I inspect. But somewhere they've got negative grade coming in, so very easy to take care of. Uh, you'll see steps that's drop down from the porch, go to the front porch, and the steps that drop down. I see them inch and a half low. A lot of times. That is where the fount the footing wasn't dug at the same time as the footprint was dug, and your block aren't tied in with the fan with the house there. So it's for a different time they pour slab and pour a different footing. And when when the footing's dug, it's it's wider than the block is. You you may be you may be out there six eight ten inches wider. When the bulldozer comes back in, does its final grade. That soft dirt, that's that earth has been disturbed and it's not set good. And if you pour concrete on that, and it's going to compact, it's going, to, it's, it's it's going to settle after after time. So uh, fix various fixes for that. That sometimes it can be raised. Uh, 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 that that I see that a lot. Sometimes it's uh, a lot of times it doesn't need codes, but I don't. I hardly ever mention codes in, in my reports. I try not to I stay away from that. But um, sometimes that's an easy fix. The whole steps, brick, concrete, block can be lifted up and supported there where you don't have that problem anymore. Um, some, maybe on a patio. You'll see uh, the door, and it's set maybe just an inch or two above the patio floor. And the water's coming, the rain comes down. And you got that threshold there. The the jams, more times than not, on a house 10, 12, 14 years ago, the jams are beginning to rot. Where that jam comes down of that patio door, it's that threshold. You have to keep that. Uh, silicone or excuse me, caulked and painted. What happens? Water is splashing on your patio, it's splashing up on your threshold. That wood, there, your trim, your brick mold, your jam, that water is wicking up in there. It, it'll rot from the bottom. And you'll, uh, you'll see a lot of times where the about a foot up, somebody's cut it and try to piece it back together uh, to make it look decent. But all it takes would be six inches of caulking on either side and some paint that solves that problem but not many people go out there looking to see you know they, they say it, it's too late when they find it so keep that in mind to look for when you're when you're looking at your problems uh, another thing is um, I, 
I don't know how many uh, inspectors write it up. I've never seen somebody else write it up. But I'd say 75% of the time, I will find garage doors that have excessive downforce. I'll hit the button, I walk over to the door, and I grab it down at the bottom. If it's more than 10 pounds of pressure down, if it doesn't go back up, it's got excessive downforce. Now, I was at a new house uh, a couple months ago. Brand new house. It was nearly completed. They had a two before laying down on the concrete floor. Somebody had closed the door too much downforce, bent the bottom panel of a brand new door. So you don't want, when, when that door comes down, it strikes up more than 10 pounds, you want it to go back up. And sometimes I've seen sensors, you know those sensors that you walk behind them and send the door right back up. I've seen them up 18 inches. Well, a kid can get under there, a pet can lay under there. And if you've got 40 pounds of pressure coming down on your little chihuahua, it's going to hurt that way. So. <laughs> or a kid, or it's going to do damage to your door. You won't have to replace that bottom panel. So I check that. Easy fix. It's got a screw up there on the opener. Usually sometimes two screws, sometimes one screw. And you may have to adjust it a couple times a year, but uh, I see that quite often. Another thing I see is, let's go back into the house there, a copper, copper pipe, uh, copper water lines. Sometimes, uh, not, not now, uh, they've switched to the hangers, but the hangers that, that hold the copper lines, they drive them into the joist that's holding your copper lines up, and they're metal. You've got, you got metal, and you've got, you got steel, and you've got copper. Well, steel and, and galvanized steel and copper don't mix. It's not you have a you have a chemical reaction there. And, you go, and so many times I'll see this corrosion on these steel hangers. And I don't touch the pipe. Some of them are so bad I, I work to touch them because it starts squirting water out. So I, I always suggest that you get those changed out. There's several different hangers you can use now that where uh, they're not steel and they'll hold those copper lines up. So if you're having your house inspected, tell your inspector to look at that. You know, or if you go under there and inspect it, go in there and, and see that you don't have the pros because that can get pretty expensive. Uh, you're going to have to replace all that copper pipe in the house. You know, that's a little something in the budget that you may not have planned for. So that, and that's an easy fix, too. You're not, you're not, we're not talking about thousands of dollars here. Uh, the houses, uh, if you're looking at a house that's 15, 20 years old, you want to know about that uh, HVAC system. To, uh, when they get around 15 years old, 12, 13, 14, 15, I'll start um, grading them as margin. I have, I have three grades. It's satisfactory marginal report. There's no grade, there's no brand new, there's no um, terrible eggs. I mean, if it's in bad shape, it's going to be poor or uh, non-operational. So make sure, have your inspector or check out the, the uh, age of that unit. And you can usually tell by on the serial number uh, how that unit is. You can tell it'll have a model number on it. Sometimes they're worn off and keep fine. It'll have a model number, but somewhere in that serial number, uh, it will have the date coded in there. You can take that serial number, look it up online, see exactly how old that unit is. So if it's 15, 16 years old, you may want to budget for a new unit. Or, you know, it's a split system. Uh, they're usually uh, the same age. Sometimes you guys. Sometimes you have to replace a condenser before you do the, the heating unit if it's a gas unit. So just some things that uh, I think you ought to look for. Walking across the floor, I can uh, walk across and well, I feel like I'm going down here a little bit. So I've, I've got a marble. I take out and I drop this marble on the floor. And if it takes off, it's wall, you know, I said, well, we got a problem that I go on the house last so I can tell uh, to look for look for some uh, foundation sagging or something going on with the floor joist also so 
walk walk through your rooms, and if you see if you see tile bucking up, but you know that, that's a clue right there. That could be several different things. That could be uh, uh, a, a bed, the mortar bed under it may not be thick enough. It could have some floor joist problems. I have in our construction company, we do we do a lot of repair, and uh, some of the things. Uh, we're repairing right now is uh, the kitchen floor of this house apparently was a little bit wavy. So this uh, homeowner had the bright idea. He just wanted to cut these uh, floor joists in half and let that floor settle down. So he had three cut floor joists. One of them's for the refrigerator set. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I've cut them. They need supporting. So what he did, he put in my two to six under his joist. Here comes his joist. Put two to six under the joist. Oh, that looks good. And he strapped it to the joist that he cut. That's the one I had like I, I like as a load bearing joist. joist. <laughs> Party as a load bearing joist. That is a load bearing joist. <laughs> <laughs> It looks. Oh, that, that suits him fine. So we're tearing everything up, starting over. Um, so if there's floor problems, you know, it doesn't mean it's a big, big, big problem. But you need to know the house you're looking at if there are joist problems in there. If there's a crack on the say over that door, if it's if you've got a little bit of settling, there's a drywall crack. Usually it's going at a 45 degrees. It's settled a little bit. That doesn't mean it's a big problem. Uh, it means it settled a little bit. Sometimes the doors won't latch. It's settled enough to where your plunger isn't meeting the keeper in there. That's an easy fix. If, if, if it doesn't require going under, doing a little bit of jacking under there, what you do, you either move, you, uh, move your keeper to where the plunger hits there and the jam where you can inset the top and, and middle hinge and pull it up just a little bit and uh, it should be good for another 20 years you know if you're a lot of houses you go in i go into they've settled but they've probably settled all they're going to you know house 40 50 years old i don't expect it to be settling anymore it's probably done all it's going to do and i, I tell people that you know is that is that dangerous is, is the, uh, is it going to fall? No, uh, just set them a little bit. So, and there's a lot of houses where we got to go in and we got to straighten them up. We've uh, lifted one house over uh, by the lake, no paper. Lifted it up, uh, I think we lifted up about three inches off the foundation. The builder was about a block shy of the pine up, had naked grade all around it. Water was flooding it in there. We put drains out front. I had to do a lot of work. That was, that was a pretty big job there, getting back to the water thing again. But most most houses are fine. Minor, minor, minor things. New houses. Um, I'll speak a little bit about new houses here. I, I was in a new house today, and I guess I found, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 small things. No, about 15 things, I guess. Uh, windows that wouldn't lock, brand new house. Your windows all be able to lock. Cracked, I found a cracked window, window that's lost its seal. I have gone in new houses before, the water heater, uh, excuse me, the uh, dishwasher. Ran the dishwasher and it's all out on the floor. Somebody forgot to uh, check it out. That, and some of the big will, they will uh, install, or the guys will install their plants, but they won't test it. So many times they don't test, test the dishwasher for some reason. So. I got some stories that uh, are remarkable, but anyway, uh, garbage disposals, sometimes they don't check the garbage disposals. <laughs> this was two months ago, new house, beautiful house, it's um, over $400,000 house. So I'm at the access doors at one end, and I'm going way back, I didn't make one trip around the perimeter on one side of the perimeter right? so i'm going up the middle checking ducks go up there and uh, i'm following the drain line the main drain line sewage line for the house so if i get up to the foundation to where it's going 
into the sewer where the pipe goes down into the sewer. My drain line's up about this high, my sewer line's that high, and there's nothing in between. <laughs> so for, for every every time they ran water, flush toilets, anything since the since the water had been cut on, it was going right into that crawl space. And the homeowner homeowner wouldn't know it probably for several months, you know, until the odor got so bad. Oh, uh, and they said, I, "What is that?" Yeah. yeah. So I had a buddy that that happened to on Green Hills, and I mean, it was uh, it was a very well-known plumbing company right here, high end. Mm -hmm. And the inspector just came by and uh, they kept saying, there must be a vent in the wall and their gas fireplace wouldn't work. And the guy went under the house to hook up the gas fireplace. He's like, ah, your upstairs bathroom is not connected to your sewer system. You're going to need oh, someone, you need to get an environmental guy out here before I can come down there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was about five months later after they moved in, to be honest. So they, yeah. it was pretty it takes that, yeah, well, I'm just saying what could be collected down there. And, and wow. At the time, they need to make the fireplace. So, my, <laughs> my job's not all that much fun, but sometimes. I'm actually on an older house. Uh, I had to lay, I opened the access door, and I had to lay a board about 10 feet into the, into the crawl space and onto the foundation out here because it went about four feet up. Sewage had been collecting right there, right there. So that was, that was pretty tough. I didn't want any sucker that night. <laughs> but even your, even your new houses, um, you, you will find, uh, you'll find things wrong with them. I mean, if you're, I, I belong to a marketing group in Goodison, I, and uh, not, not a marketing group, but a networking group. And I'm always telling them, if you're buying or selling a house, either one, you need an inspection. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter, matter if you're buying or selling. I, I just did one for uh, did an inspection for friends of ours, and I'm doing the work for them. Uh, but he. If somebody's going to get a great house because every little thing, they want that house perfect as they're moving out. And I said, you know, just talking about the receptacles and things like that. One. I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. I said, that's not going to help you sell a house. I said, I'll fix it if you want to, you know, or I'll we'll paint this or we'll do this. But I said, it's not going to help you sell a house. And you're putting money. That's okay. I want it done. That's the type of people you buy a house from. They're, 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 Selling it just like they're going to buy it, right? So, and and the uh, I know, uh, I'm not, I can't say I'm, I'm an investor, it's like saying somebody asked me if I ever gamble. I said, No, I don't gamble. I'm like, this is one I was building. I said, Wait a minute, I build spec houses, mm -hmm. yeah, I do gamble <laughs> <laughs> big time, lost big time, too. but um. And I lost my train of thought there, but I mean, I, you know, I'm all over the place. But, uh, is, is, any questions? And I, you have any questions? Yeah, you say you're a contractor, and a lot of contractors uh, turn into home inspectors because it's easy, you know, it's a license, you need that experience. Is it proper for you to, when a homeowner says, well, hey, uh, how much do you think it's going to cost? Because they want to take that air conditioner uh, that you say is uh, marginal off the price or uh, fix a floor. Is it proper for you to give them a price, even though you are a uh, licensed, well, you're not a licensed contract, but you're part of the Or should you say to be separate, you know, and you should you should look into that. You know. Well, I try, I try to have a, uh, I try to get a personal relationship with my clients, you know, buyers or sellers. Mm -hmm. And if they ask me a question, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give them a price right then. I'm going to give them a range, mm -hmm. you know, and, and get something like common knowledge. You know, this unit's going to cost you somewhere $6,500 to $7,500, depending on who you get and what type you get, you know. So I will, if they ask me, I will give them, uh, I'll give them a, a, a ballpark figure. And if they ask me, I'll tell them how, how it can be repaired. But on my reports, I don't do that. Uh, I'll, I'll just, I, I, don't, I don't tell whoever's going to repair it how to do it. I just say, recommend uh, repair. Now, by law, when you do your air conditioning inspection, 
Are you, you are supposed to, at least I thought it was, test to see if the air conditioner is running between the certified limits of what they're supposed to do. You saying that the, that the air conditioner is marginal, well, how do you know it's marginal? It might last another 20 years, it's just not. like that. That's just what, I, oh, it's shot. I get that all the time. Yeah. So he has yeah. to say that he is not a specialist, that he's a GP. Well, he should say they do. it tested between the proper ranges. And that's what I can say. I put that proper range in there. And I also put in there, I, I marked it marginal because it's 16 years old. So, uh, I, I, sometimes even I think that's misleading because they, they can last another six times. Oh, they can. I had one. I had one last uh, eighteen years. I had uh, and I sold the house, moved out of it, and it's still running better. Replaced the fan motors all over here. Yeah, sometimes the older ones are actually easier to work on. Oh, they are. <laughs> then I had one like a new one uh, a few years ago. A new one lasted six years. Yeah. How much is a uh, inspection? How much do you charge? It goes by square footage. Uh, I charge up to fourteen hundred square feet. I charge three hundred. Uh, fourteen hundred to thirty-two hundred square feet is three fifty. After thirty-two hundred square feet, it's thirteen cents a square foot additional. Now you're going to make ten thousand dollars on a house. Steve and I do this all the time. We, we hire a home inspector to winter before we get done. Just so there's no surprises when the, sure. when they hire exactly for three hundred bucks you should actually put it in your no, numbers. We, no, we, we do something a little different. We uh, uh, I'll do. I don't even ask for a report. Mm -hmm. I'll ask for give me a line item list. No, sure. No warranties. No representations. I just want a a what's going to hit me if I'm flipping house yeah. on on my rehab. So we'll finish a rehab up and. We get basically a half inspection. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, go through. You don't have to write a full blown report, but I want to know. I want to be in front of what a buyer is going to pop me on, and and usually they charge like one hundred fifty bucks. Yeah. Well, that's that's you you can do that because of your your experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you don't need every little detail now. Um, well, right now, you talked about your grading, mm -hmm. so you didn't talk about the roof. So if the roof is between 10 and 15 years old, is it a marginal roof? If if it's um, like a three tile roof and it's uh, 18 years old, it usually shows up. And I'll tell them, you know, this is it's a three tile. It's a it's a 20 25 year roof. And, and people ask me all the time, you know, uh, how long is that roof going to last? Well, I don't know. I don't know what kind of weather we're going to have. I can tell you, you've got excessive loss of granules, you've got big bare spots, and you've got tar showing, and you've got fiberglass showing, and those UV rays down there, and that, that's drying it out and it's cracking it, and, or they're curling, you know. Uh, you sell them my insurance agent. You're going to have the granules in the gutter, too. You see granules, you see granules filled up. It's like an 11 year old room, though. 11 year old, yeah. there shouldn't be any problems unless it's, unless it's uh, damaged. Uh, Unless, you know, it's had a lot of hail. I was with a guy yesterday who was talking to me, and he was asking, asking me, he all had huge water damage down in the Governor's Club. The nice one, yeah, 750000 dollars Water's rolling in. He has sixty thousand dollars worth of piers going around this house to raise it back up. He's digging a trench around the outside and making a French drain right around this complete house. But he said while he was up there, he was on his second the roof and they're putting no drip edge. Is drip edge code? No. No? No, it used to be standard practice to have drip edge here, and I really like it. I, I always used it because and it's it's not used as much now because of uh, moisture decking is uh, OSB. Uh, on your plywood, on your edges, you saw delamination quite a bit, and it, it helped prevent that some. 
but it's not required now. And I, I very seldom see it. Uh, really? Because he was very adamant, and he called the roofer up. He says, we never used it. Well, yeah, and he thought it was code. That's because people are pushing stuff. I mean, no, people don't do stuff right anymore. I mean, a lot of people, the stuff he's talking about, moving a door. Yeah. I got put a door in for me the other day, and it sucked, and I could see through it. And it was an outside door, and I could tell him, and he's like, oh, man, that thing. I had one of my old timers go over there. He's about 65, 66. And, it took him three hours, but the door, he set the door in there, he said, yeah, it's a little tight, but it wasn't, and it's perfect now, you know? It's, you gotta wait for the house to settle, and it'll be perfect. Yeah. Well, this house, nah, his marble will never stop rolling. <laughs> so so you know, the the problem, you know, if you notice the problems with the 50s oh, houses, you know, they don't overhang that much. I had one that we back. Uh -huh. Everything looked great on the inside of the house. I thought it was in good shape. Until we started putting in the vinyl windows, there's nothing to hook to. We had to tear it all out and put new seal plates, bottom plates, and everything around. Yeah. Plus, there almost every window because it weak back up and run back down inside and lock yeah. it out. And I just want to be running across any of those. I say, I, you know, but there's a ton of leaving around. You know? Luckily, I don't do many houses in the 50s. Uh, you know, I, I, I uh, well, that was three miles. Yeah, it was all a lot, a lot, of, a lot around downtown Nashville. You know, I don't do that much right, right in town. Uh, most of mine are, uh, I'd say, it's probably 60, 65, uh, that's But I, I have done them. I, I know the problem you're talking about. It is a problem. When, when you come to the roof deck and it's three quarter inch planking up there, and you and you sit a lot of times right there and then down the wall there, and that side edge of your roof. Uh, of your decking up there on your roof and stuff. So. Also, the rental, property, rental property is right beside the, where the tub is, where they let the shower get down and you're next to the mow. Real soft up there in most of the property. But, you know, that, yeah. That's the first thing I look at. Because you know, yeah. that floor is going to have to be tail, tail sign. Because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't they let the shower. Why do you strap to the, uh, the rotten beam above? <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, I'll leave your cards here for anybody who wishes. Uh, we really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it. What we would love to do uh, is have our camera crew go out and follow around a few of these yeah. houses. And uh, we'd like to uh, actually see you do uh, do a several of these live. I mean, uh, not live, but uh, recorded. And we you know get a uh, commercial. If you do commercial, do a duplex, do a couple of houses. Uh, you know, do a, a couple of different. That'd be great. And we'll actually, we'll actually document for you. Yeah, I had that problem with that down uh, the down pressure of the of the garage door too. And I told my kid, if he ever bends my garage door by hanging under there, uh, he's going to be in big trouble. <laughs> So, all right. Well, we don't. We're uh, pushing the time a little bit. But Mike was so interesting. We uh, I, we indulged him. I'm going to bring up Steve right now. He'll uh, finish the night out with you guys. I hope you uh, enjoyed and learned something today. And I hope you become uh, green members. Thanks, Steve. Right. Uh, anyway, um. I'd just like to do a couple of quick comments. Just so you guys know, if you haven't got a home inspector, those are extremely reasonable prices. Um, I don't know. Having sold plenty of houses, I know with a home inspector's charge. Um, and uh, in the flip game, it is good. You can do a full pre inspect, but if you're. Um, you know, there's a lot of what we do in investing on on various levels deals with psychology. So somebody buys a property, it's renovated, they want something that's effectively, effectively like a new house. So they walk into your 1950 house that you just renovated, and you have if you haven't buttoned it up the right way, and you get a, a first time buyer, they're going to see the defects. So if if you haven't done things correctly, if you've skipped over certain things, you're, you're going to get caught. Um, any purchaser that halfway knows what they're doing, unless you're putting it up on the market at a, at a significant discount below what it's worth, they're going to catch this stuff. So it's, it's always good to, to pre-inspect, um, to get in front of that, because when you're flipping a property, you renovate it. More often than not, the 
first offers that you get are going to be your best offers because the, the the people that see these properties when they hit the market they're your hottest people it's it's inevitably proves to be true so it's always something to keep in mind get some good relationships with your home inspectors um and and get pre-inspections done and uh, uh and another thing it's also good to have the uh, an inspector that doesn't elevate the fear level, that doesn't kill a deal. Mm -hmm. um, in most situations, the stuff you're going to fix on your house costs less than the stuff you're going to fix on your car. If something breaks down. Mm -hmm. Not to say that serious things can't be consequential, they can, but it's not that difficult to fix things on your house, usually. But people tend to fear what they don't know, and you, you need to gain some knowledge so um, um, home inspection is always a great subject especially for investors uh, and people that want to become particularly more articulate in speaking about houses you guys all need to dig into this get to know these people and and, and yeah get into this mindset anyway um I want to thank everybody for coming as you guys know this is green global real estate Ex education network um we have these meetings to educate people they're free and open to the public we also have, as you guys know, an online training platform. Uh, this is a network marketing company. It's a business opportunity. Uh, so you have the ability to come on, mentor with people who are extremely experienced, industry professionals, um, people who are out there flipping houses. Like I said, Mark and I, in our group here, we bought three this week. We bought, I think, 14 this year so far. And if you join my company and you're doing the online training, you have me as a personal consultant. So you have the opportunity to network with people who are millionaires, who have a tremendous amount of experience in the business. And we encourage professionals to join us also. Um, we charge uh, $109.94, it's $109.94 a month to be a part of this business opportunity. It also gives you guys the ability to to bring people in and to make money, residual income, by introducing this business model to other people. Um, I don't know what everybody does here. I know a lot of you guys, I see a couple of new faces, uh, see a lot of the same faces, um, but I can tell you, you're not gonna change your life unless you're getting out and networking with people who are doing what we're doing. Um, We've had deals recently in real estate. These are life-changing events for people. Um, I'm looking at one, and I might tell you about it. I, it's uh, every year or two, you get a deal that's a multiple six-figure deal that you have to do nothing. Uh, and we had three last year, three deals alone, no effort into the deals to make $1.2 million just by being there. Don't do those kind of things in your life unless you're a part of groups like this where it's not just book sense it's not just that kind of intelligence you have to get in the mind of people who are getting the deals Jeff you know this I mean Jeff, I didn't show up with a late box on the other day I do know that <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's okay, a great example. example. Okay, yeah. so you know about that property. My, I didn't get off my butt and go to the auction. And you knew about the auction. Well, Les had called me first and he said, hey, can you go? And I was like, I'm not sure. Then I called him back and he's like, well, Steve's going. I was like, okay. And I went and then I know the rest of the story. But to make a long story short, I was talking to Les the other day. And he's like, oh, yeah, that worked out. We made 35 grand. I was like, so the fact that I didn't drive to Henderson go, cost me some of the 35 grand. So <laughs> with no effort. Yeah, with, with no effort. And, and and we didn't even and not even have to put up any money. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'd do that kind of stupid. So, so anyway, and, and, and so the point is, and, and I'm not, I, I'm not trying to, there's not, I'm not, there's nothing, I'm, I, I'm not. But it's still it hard is, work. It's still hard work. It, it is. Yeah. It is. It is. And the point is, you don't, this is not the education that comes strictly even though we talk we have live interactive online training it doesn't just come from reading a book you don't get it that way yeah you, you get it from talking to the people that are out there doing it in a format like we're doing tonight where half the people who are lazy or tired or whatever they may not be lazy but they just they want to enjoy their lives they don't want additional stress they don't want to come out on a Wednesday night because there's traffic okay 
Now I can respect some people go to church, and that's the, that's fine. But you know that's that's a different thing. But I'm saying if you if you want to change something and make something happen, you've got to get active and involved. And you you can kick tires all day until you make a commitment to make that real change. You're not going to change it. So that's my point. Um, we're here to be consultants. The whole point of Green is to create mentor-based relationships. That's what we do with network marketing. So um, instead of charging thousands of dollars for guru kind of seminars, we charge $109.94 a month. We have people with a lot of different professional insights, different perspectives. They come and they deliver a different message, and we try to enrich everyone around us. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Try it. We're only 10 minutes over. Not too bad. Um, uh, we open the doors usually around 6, start at 6.30, and we'll be respectful of everyone's time. Um, if you guys are interested, I think I think I'll, most everyone's here members. I, I, I haven't met y'all yet. Uh, if you're interested, you're interested, you're interested in joining. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> John's not a member yet. Um, I think I heard uh, um, Zach and Jaren. Uh, was it Zach and Jaren? Yeah, that's Zach is our pal. I don't know. Okay, cool. Ask Andrea yeah. who's coming up uh, next week. Uh, yeah, Andrea, who do we have next week? Okay, uh, I'll actually do more than that. I was ready for you this time, Mark. You didn't get me. March 21st, Kathy Carter, uh, she's going to be speaking on real estate and divorce. She has a specialty in that area where she trains realtors, what realtors need to know with regard to divorce. Uh, then um, March 28th, we have Darren Hickman coming in, and this is probably going to be a good one for your fix and flippers, the people that are buying the houses like you do you know, at auction and dealing with odor control um, and how to deal with that in the properties that you buy. And then we actually have a two-part session coming up April 4th and 11th, and that is going to be Tish Baldwin's, and she's a title attorney. So that's what we've got coming up in the next four weeks. Just a quick question. Anybody ever flip a doghouse or a cat house? No. <laughs> I, I did one, believe it or not. And, and if you if you do enough in the flipping game, one with fifty four cats. Well, smokers too. If you have heavy back in the day when you used to get those ones with the ceilings where you all. Yeah, it's a little yeah. different with the cat house. <laughs> yeah, I've you never had, had the cats. I've had yet to put time. enzymes on so something like nine <laughs> times. My. And the enzymes, they're not dangerous chemicals, but you can't buy them. You you have to you have to get somebody with a pest control license to buy them. So the enzymatic chemicals that you have to put on on the every single surface of the cat house, it's just it's it's pretty intense. It's more than just taking the carpets out, it sucks into the wood, the concrete. Oh, oh yeah, totally. And then yeah. the insulation. You can't you can't even just kill you can't kill it five times, it's still there. You get mold. Yeah. Mold's a good thing. Yeah. 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 All this chloride. I didn't know what you were saying to say, but I thought it was going to be the complex. Of course, we got to move back to Nashville. Yeah. One of the units was completely empty. Uh -huh. It had three or four layers of carpet. Where the cats have been in there, and that's all they did was put the old carpet on top of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. No, oh. I did have one now, that I remember. I was like a smaller guy. And they would. Now you're three scaring three those guys yeah. away. <laughs> we never have these problems. Yeah. 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 They don't have problems. <laughs> so anyway, uh, like I said, everyone, um, we're about to start a large nationwide launch, so um, I hope uh, if, uh, if you guys are going to join, get your download spot soon because we take this seriously and we're about to blow this thing up. And um, thanks for coming. Uh, you guys will be up in another 20 minutes to exchange cards. Um, Andrea, is, was there anyone else online that needed to say hi? Did Jamie say hi to us tonight? Actually, I think Eva's online, if I'm reading that telephone number right. Hi, Eva, you out there? Hey. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for the education tonight. And I'm just looking forward to meeting each and every one of you and um, helping to grow the membership. Lots of good things coming up. Hi, Eva. Where, what is it? Where do you live? He's asking where Eva lives. Oh, I'm so sorry. I am in Dallas, Texas. 
All right, so we broadcast from anywhere to anywhere. I'm one of those people that didn't have to drive in traffic tonight. I got to call you from my living room. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>